Well, this is uh, unique for me. As, uh, as was mentioned, I started my career in FinTech about 20 years ago. And uh, I remember my first deal, I came, you know, picked up the phone, called my parents, said, hey guys, I found my specialization. It's financial technology. My father said, you'll be a barista within six months. And my mother cried. So to see this room full of people, you know, passionate about FinTech is really uh, a huge step forward. Uh, to answer the question about karma or fate, I don't know, but uh, I spent my whole life trying to get out of Montreal, and I'm at the bank that was on the corner of my street, so I don't know what that says about me. I, I want to add some data around you know, what we're seeing out there from a fintech perspective. I would say RBC, thanks to people such as Alex, who's in the room here, and Ali and some of the other members of the team, has been a true sort of pioneer and passionate advocate of fintech globally. But we don't do that against sort of a naked backdrop. It's against the backdrop of innovation pushing across frontiers, product sets, asset classes, you name it. And so when I sort of look at what's happening out there, you know, I look at the numbers as, as it relates to you know, funding coming into the sector. And what you can see here very clearly is you know, the dollar volume that's moving into private equity, be it growth equity, VC or otherwise, is at all time highs. So the numbers that you can see here are staggering, $872 billion. What's even more interesting from my perspective is the amount of dry powder that's sitting on the sidelines. So there is about 1.8 trillion of dry powder that exists across these various enterprises that are actively pursuing tech opportunities, but in, within those tech opportunities, FinTech remains the disproportionate area of investment versus other areas of the tech sector. What does that mean from a US perspective? You know, US, US venture-backed, Activity is at sort of a decade level high. You can see here $86.4 billion flowing into the sector. But what's most interesting about that is sort of the growth in valuation and the growth of value of the companies that underpin these trends. So, you know, the unicorn was a term that was coined how many years ago to describe something very unique in nature. We can see that's not so unique anymore with over 145 unicorns in the US alone. If you were to look at that number globally, it'd be north of 300 just to give you a sense of the size and scale. Some of that is just capital actively pursuing and pushing up valuations. We see, you know, on average, valuations almost double. Uh, almost every sub-vertical within FinTech is at all-time highs in the public markets as well as in the private markets. Um, and what we're also seeing here is because of the wealth of capital that's available, going back to that 1.8 trillion I mentioned previously, um, companies are staying private longer. Um, we'll see a few of those test the market probably this year for more internal reasons as opposed to external, but the capital is there, the bid is there for the right business. So that's all well and good. We have a U.S. investment banker, albeit one that was born in Canada, telling us about the U.S. market. So what? You know, those trends, I think, are even more, you know, um, we see those almost accelerating in the Canadian market. You know, the U.S. is looking for new pockets of talent, new pockets of opportunity, and the success of the community here within in Toronto, Vancouver, and unfortunately to a lesser extent Montreal, um, you know, has driven you know, outsized investment in the marketplace. And you can see the numbers here, 50% CAGR over the last five years as far as investment you know, in the Canadian FinTech landscape. Uh, $1.3 billion in 2018. If you were to sort of, you know, sort of play a game with me, let's bet a case on one, it's what that number would look like in 2019, you're probably talking a number that I would posit probably closer to three million, just to give you a sense of the pace and the acceleration in the marketplace. You know, this is not happening within just a vacuum. Aside from, you know, community-like events like this, you know, there's other sort of areas that are being expanded upon. The Open Banking Initiative here in Canada should introduce a number of new opportunities for, for fintech startups. Cryptocurrency remains, you know, key area of focus of the marketplace here. And so we expect to see the pace of innovation continue here uh, in the Canadian marketplace. So when we talk about fintech, the first issue I always have with fintech is defining what is fintech. So when we think about fintech at RBC, we think of it as five verticals. Vertical one being payments, vertical two being market structure, so we view the trading ecosystem as being you know, fintech. Uh, vertical three would be financial software, vertical four would be info services, and then vertical five would be disruptive financial services. So this is, uh, they gave me eight minutes, so we'll do a speed round here around some of the verticals. Payments, if you were to sort of take the numbers that I, I, that I put up before, accounts for about half the investment across the entirety of the fintech investment pool. That is the area of the, you know, 
the highest level of growth. It's probably the one area where we see the most amount of destruction, destruction, disruption and destruction, uh, and one where you can see the numbers are absolutely staggering. So whether we're talking about a B2B market that is pure white space with 30 trillion of TAM associated to it, um, you know, the 1.5 trillion in the gig economy, payments is an area that's going to continue to experience outsized innovation over the near to medium term. Alternative lending, a personal favorite of mine because this is one where we start to see you know, a number of you know, interesting factors come into the marketplace, but one where we see a real schizophrenia as exists to both the private and public markets. And so if you were to look at sort of the opportunity here, I think everyone agrees that you know, the traditional FICO model and other sort of methods of scoring risk and pricing risk are outdated and not in tune with the big data uh, views of the world. That being said, if you were to look at the public comparables, uh, mainly in the United States, you would see models that have been yet to be proven out and coming under increasing stress, especially as the market becomes increasingly volatile from an economic point of view. Wealth tech, this is probably the one area we're most excited about, simply because of the, you know, we talked about the wealth transfer, you know, occurring, you know, intragender and then, you know, through generations, but this is one where there is so much data to be analyzed that is just sitting there latent. And you know, we're just starting to scratch the surface of what companies are going to be able to do to unlock that data to offer either new products, uh, to create new algorithms, or alternatively to move from a reactive type industry to a proactive industry. So that is one that we're watching quite closely. Um, and then you know, no fintech speech would be complete without talking about blockchain and crypto. Um, you know, the numbers you can see here on the right hand side are staggering in that it almost doubles on a year to year basis as it relates to investment. And despite the dislocation that we've seen in the underlying cryptocurrencies, yeah, we expect that pace to continue just given the massive opportunity of unlocking value uh, in the crypto sector. So I think I hit my eight minutes and that is that. Do I do questions or no questions? Oh, okay, great. Stunned silence. This is good. Oh. Do you see any appetite in the Canadian capital markets towards fintech, or is it exclusively in the United States? Um, it's a great question. Um, I think this is the year we're going to start to see multiple Canadian companies access the public markets from a fintech point of view. Um, the challenge is kind of twofold. One there is not sort of a comparable you can point to in the universe, and so people are going to have to redefine the valuation paradigm, which can be scary, uh, but I think you'll have a couple that will do so primarily in the payment sector. Um, so yes, yeah, so I think capital markets activity will increase. I think there's also good parallels to be drawn with other economies, you know, Australia, other natural resource economies where you know, a tech champion is needed, just given the lack of tech investment opportunities. So they'll look to capitalize on that. But this is a year where my prediction would be anywhere from two to four companies that would be fintech will access the Canadian markets. And we're talking about companies of scale, billion dollars plus of enterprise value. Do you see the trends that have caused, I believe it was uh, all the drive gunpowder is the phrase that you used, yes. all that capital sitting on the sidelines waiting for an opportunity. Do you see that trend continuing into 2019, reversing or maintaining its position? So I think the, uh, we're, we're going to see a lot of that dry powder get used in the next 12 months, primarily because private equity firms, the, the environment for raising capital for a private equity firm is as good as it's ever going to get. And so a lot of funds want to cycle through their capital to get that next fund ahead of dislocation in the marketplace. So if I were to sort of project outwards, call it 18 months, 24 months, you'd probably see that dip below the trillion dollar mark. Uh, just because funds, you know, every time we sort of have an opportunity, you know, historically it's always been, well, that check size is a little too big. Now the check size is never big enough. They all want to lean in. So it's always they want to flex up is the right term. So I think that's shrinking, but that's more a function of they want to get the money out the door and raise again before uh, the party start, it stops. I think uh, FinTech is a bubble. Convince me otherwise. FinTech is a boggle? I think is this is a huge, huge boggle. I think that this is amazing technology. I work in the financial uh, tech myself, space myself, but I think this is a huge bubble. Bubble, okay, got it, okay. Uh, well, so listen, I have had the perspective of being old and old in FinTech, and so I've seen 
the various gyrations through 2000, 2008. And the one thing that I would say, which is kind of interesting, and I wish I had a slide on it, is if you look at what's happened in the marketplace during those big disruptions, fintech has always been the most defensive of the sectors within tech. And so it's viewed as a flight to quality. Um, we could argue whether it's a bubble from a valuation point of view. As I mentioned, we're at all-time highs. That being said, if you look at some of the dislocation that's happened recently, the guys who have held the ground the most has been the fintech companies. Because I think the view is, as it relates to fintech, is the TAM is massive. Uh, there's, no, there's no way to turn off the spigot as it relates to spending in fintech if you want to remain competitive as a financial services institution. So it might be toppy. I wouldn't call it a bubble. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you.